All right, everyone, welcome to another All Access. I'm here with composer Aldo Schlacko. Aldo, thank you so much for uh, joining me this evening. Thank you for inviting me. So uh, let's just jump into it. I, I'd love to, you know, know about your background and your, your, you know, t tell me, t talk to me about growing up and your what your childhood was like and when did music find its way into your life? How early did you kind of get into music? Well, I was born in Albania. Um, and when I was about five or six, uh, I got enrolled into a music school. Uh, it was my father that noticed that I was responding to uh, music that I was hearing. And that was it. So, and for the rest of my life, I studied until grad school at USC. Um, from Albania first, I went to Greece. Then I went to Montreal where I did my undergrad. Then, uh, at, uh, then I went to LA for um, uh, the USC program, for the scoring program. And uh, I ended up staying. And, so um, was uh, was film music always the goal or were you interested in other genres, other different types of music? Or was it always about film and television and composing for the screen? Actually, no. Actually, initially it was for the theater. Believe oh, it wow. Or not. It was yeah, it was for theater because both my parents are, are actors, theater oh, okay. actors. Yeah, so I'm raised, uh, I basically, I would just go and watch them every night and, and see the plays and they would play music as they were, you know, the theater on their plays, they had music on tape at the time. And actually was the, um, was on uh, on tape with the um, uh, Magra, with Magras, the Magra system. And, uh, and they had a person that would select the music for every play. So that, that that effect that impact that the, the music had on those plays was what really got me interested in in having music in in, in the music for stage basically yeah, so, wow. yeah and film was at some point the um the organic yeah. transition into the into doing something that i was kind of in awe since i was a kid were you aware of like the different composers working in, in film at the time? Did you have any inspirations growing up that you really kind of gravitated towards? Yeah. And uh, well, Morricone was the one that. Uh, yeah, of course, you know, everybody. For us in Europe was Morricone because obviously every Italian film that we watch illegally because foreign channels were prohibited in, uh, during communism in Albania. Wow. Yeah. Somehow Morricone was the composer. But obviously, there was also the old westerns that had Steiner, that had uh, uh, Tiomkins, and that had uh, Bernstein. Yeah. That we would, and, uh, and of course, mind blowing at the time. I did not necessarily pay attention too much who wrote it or not, but uh, because it didn't mean anything at the time, I was a kid. But the, the impact of the the music, and it was just a magnificent seven. For example, when I first saw it, it was just like, oh wow. my god, you know, like. <laughs> That's mind blowing. Yeah, it changes your life. <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm curious, uh, you know, as someone who came to the United States, I know there's a lot of uh, composers and artists out there who might be living outside of the US who might want to come to Hollywood who want to move out here. Was that a big shift for you? I mean, leaving your home country, starting a life? Was that were you excited? Were you nervous? Like, what was that experience for you? And how would you maybe give any advice to young composers who want to do the same thing and, and come over here? Uh, the answer is twofold in a twofold because uh, in my uh, for me first leaving my own country had nothing to do with a career so it was not right. a career it was survival it was uh, we had to run um, we had to leave the country because of communism and uh, under we had a dictatorship and my family was um, one of those the many albanian families that were considered as enemy of the state and um, so so I left not to pursue a career in music or in, in film music. It was mostly to just get out of Albania at the time, prior wow. to 90, like 1990s. Uh, but going to LA was from Montreal, from Canada, was right. strictly, that one was a, was, a, was a decision that had to do strictly with the film scoring. Um, and I had, uh, I had decided to check three, three places for, for where I went to go for grad school. One of them was Los Angeles, USC, and I decided to go there first to see it for two weeks. And once I saw what the program was and um, once I saw where they were recording their sessions as part of the program, 
at Paramount State Jam, and w once I saw the musicians playing those compositions, it, I'm like, this is it. There's no, there's no way I'm going to even go to the other places and check them out. I'm sure they're they're amazing too, but those musicians in LA, they're they're scary. They're mind blowing. They're, yeah, <laughs> they're amazing. They're amazing. So uh, absolutely. Not to say not to say that there's no other great musicians in other places, but for some reason, uh, in Los Angeles, you have these musicians that somehow they understand the language. I think it's a question of uh, having it done for so long, and yeah. it's part of the texture of the not only their perform uh, sight reading and so on, but they know what what it means to play for film scores. They somehow understand it. It's in their DNA. Absolutely. So was what were kind of the first steps you took to kind of get your foot in the door? What were what was the first jobs you maybe took? What would you consider kind of the, the big kind of aha moment where you're like, OK, now I'm a professional film composer, you know? <laughs> well, I, I I haven't had that moment yet. I, I still think that. <laughs> oh, come on. I, 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 <laughs> You've been well, working for so long and doing so many amazing yeah, work. <laughs> but every time you get that blank page in front of you, there's that moment. Oh, boy, here we go yeah. again. What do we do now? You know, there's right. that moment of every artist, I think, has that moment, be that a painter, be that a composer, be that a, an actor, I guess, to create something from from nothing. And uh, but I, I kind of got a soft landing in L.A. because I came to study. And then right after my studies there, uh, uh, Chris Young, Christopher Young, the composer, he, yes. he offered me a job to work for him. And uh, I kind of worked for him a few years. I so so I it was in, an immense. Um, I got a wealth of information and uh, and uh, how it was done and and we saw Chris doing like Spider Man three like the core some major major movies and to see someone deal with that kind of a project and that kind of a score and dealing with like a hundred piece orchestra and eighty piece choirs and and you know spider-man you know yeah huge huge projects that was like you know it was great it's it's a it's a life uh, it's an education let's put it that way absolutely know? and then you got to probably i'm sure got to hang out at his house and see all his big collection of oh. horror things <laughs> of course that's uh yeah the, the halloween stuff and the pumpkins and the, the oh yeah <laughs> it's the best i love going there just to and he's so generous with everybody he gives his number out to yeah you know what, Chris is one of the most generous people I've ever met in my life, like literally. And uh, I come from a country where generosity is kind of a part of the culture and let's share everything we have because they didn't have anything to, to share. So might as well share everything, you know. So, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but Chris is one of those people that it's mind blowing how generous he is. I mean, as a he's because he he teaches as well. And and he's so I, I would go to signings and photograph, you know, take, you know, the signing and covering it and you know young fans were talking to him and he's just like oh call me let me uh, you know here's my number if you need advice or anything he's just so generous and i'm just like i've never seen that from another you know per professional industry so it's, it's very infectious too yeah i don't know if you know but at some point he had bought a house with uh, multiple rooms and he would give those rooms to people that wanted to make it to la and he would just yeah. charge them dollars a month rent and that was like insane you know and uh, and going back to chris now uh, and to refer to your first question uh coming to la chris has told me something once very very profound that it took me a bit of time to understand what he was saying he said to me after i worked for him for like a year or so he said to me do you you do realize that you've achieved 50 percent of the success that you 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 ever dreamt i'm like what is he talking about it's 3 a.m you know, I don't know what is it, you know, I wasn't sure what he was talking about. But then he explained, he said, well, you did pick up that suitcase and you came to L.A. And uh, there's a lot of people that for some reason they don't make the decision. Their, their family issues, their money issues, visa issues, I don't know, you know, life, mm -hmm. I guess. And they, there's that split moment when you say, ah, I'm not going to do that, you know, the change. I'm not going to pick up that suitcase. Uh, but this this was like 15, 17 years ago. So today yeah. the world changed a bit. So it's not the same as before. You don't have to be in LA, I, I think, today. I, to I believe so too. I think you can be anywhere. Yeah. yeah. Of course. Now the, the whole thing, the industry has changed a lot. So you can be anywhere you want. You can have your studio anywhere you want. You know, everything is online. You can upload, download, remotely record. That's it. You know? Yeah. 
Yeah, it's a whole different uh, world. But I mean, at the time, yeah, that that gen I've heard those stories as well. How you just kind of create a landing pad for for young composers and and which is invaluable, you know, at the time. You know, LA is a it's a scary place when you first get here. <laughs> yeah, but but to see someone actually deal with a project of that magnitude, let's say uh, let's say Zimmer, the Zimmer camp there, the remote control. I mean, that's a that's a that's a university to work for those people over there dealing with uh, projects like dune and oh, i mean they're defining the way how projects are done especially yes. when it comes to it's an art form uh, and to see that from up close and to be part of the the mechanism that makes it work and so on it's it's invaluable it's you could never get that uh, insight yeah so it's, a, it's a collaborative uh, it's a collaborative art form of every from every aspect from behind the camera behind the music behind the acting i mean the talent the, the, look at the credits at the end of every movie you know? <laughs> oh it's a, i would strongly suggest uh, let's say the young people let's say that are you know thinking to jump into this profession that working for someone or interning for someone or uh, assisting someone it's actually something that will benefit you in the long term so you they should do it i've done it myself and i i can recommend it enough Absolutely. So let's uh, jump into your process as a composer. You know, um, I'd love to, before we jump into the comeback trail, which is fantastic, and I'm so glad people are finally getting a chance to see the film and hear your score. Um, but let's just talk maybe on a general level. I'd I always like to ask composers the same question because I always get a, a different answer and it always intrigues me. Um, where does the first note come from for you? When, I know it's going to different be different on every project, but what's kind of your, I guess, if you had a, if you had a kind of like a blank canvas and you ha had your way of doing things, what's, where do you gravitate towards? Do you like to talk to your director first, read the script? Do you like to wait for that first cut uh, or just uh, noodle on the piano? Or do you like to have images on screen i mean what's kind of your process to get that first kind of idea out of your head for the comeback trail uh i was lucky enough to to be to to have been involved since the skip stage i actually mm -hmm. knew about the film even before uh, george was writing it and so on and and we had worked before on on some other projects and he did say to me right. that i have one i have one that you really would like this one and and a few, a couple of months later, he sends me the script and I read it and I couldn't stop laughing because it's so <laughs> hilarious, the whole thing. It's just so, you know, out there. And, uh, and you know, and I, after I spoke with him, I said, what are you thinking in terms of, I just went to see what he's thinking, if he's thinking the same thing that I had in mind. I kind of was sure because we had had the discussion prior to even reading the script. And he's like, oh, this is the one we, we just go for it. I'm like, okay, so... <laughs> So I picked I picked three moments in the movie and I actually started writing on the script and uh, oh wow yeah without even talking to him what he you know no discussion whatsoever so by the time I was working on it and, and writing some things and doing some mock-ups just so I had the themes on the piano and also I did a mock-up just to give a to get a sense of what it could sound like orchestrated and so on. They had started shooting the movie, so uh, they invited me to New, to, uh, New Mexico on set to, to spend a couple of days there. And as I, I went for two days, I ended up staying a week because it was so nice, so good yeah. to, to, to see all those. I mean, you see De Niro on set, you see Morgan Freeman on set, you see Tommy Lee Jones, Zach Braff, all these. I mean, the cast is insane. It's an amazing cast, and, yeah. Oh, yeah, and you see these guys, man. I mean, dedication and the the investment the artistic investment the, the the everything was on like their hearts were on the platter and and that's so inspiring because then you say you know what i, I gotta go and write back a few like a few more versions of the same theme you know it's, you get inspired so i showed uh, i showed george what i had written i said here's a few themes on the piano and george's like oh yeah sounds great i get it because george is very musically um uh, he's a trained musician george mm -hmm. Director George Gallo. So, um, so I, uh, it's very easy to talk with him about music, um, and he's like, "Oh, great! I see it. Perfect. Sounds great." And I said, "Oh, hold on a second. I have the mock-ups too." And once he heard the mock-ups, he's like, "That's it. Go. That keep writing." <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, uh, so it was a good start. Very motivating for me because had he said, "Oh, you're in the wrong direction." <laughs> It would have been like, oh, what did I do here? <laughs> but uh, no, he gave me win throughout the process. And he let me just do my thing. He actually even, I, I've mentioned it once that uh, today, uh, talking with Tracy, the music supervisor, Tracy McKnight, uh, that George actually had some like 
what I would consider, quote, crazy idea is like, you know what? I think you should do an overture to this score. You know, we should open the movie with like a five, six minutes of overture, you know, like the old times, you know, you have, I'm like, George, I mean, I would love this, but, you know, can you imagine now a Netflix stuff? Right. Uh, stuff, you who would wait six minutes until the movie starts, you know? So, <laughs> uh, so we came down to a compromise and the overture does exist, but as the end credits, we put it there for the go. end credits. Perfect. Yeah. So I mean, oh, you, yeah, you have a great relationship with George, uh, and I, I'm 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 curious now, uh, since he is a musician, I, I'm, I want to ask, is, and you say it's so easy to talk about to talk to him about music, but I'm curious, does he he has that musical ear? Can he catch things like maybe you try to sneak something by, and he's like, I'm calling you out, Aldo. I know what you're doing. <laughs> George George is very very um, particular, and his yeah. at the same time he's very uh, easygoing. His mm. uh, his bohemian type he's a uh, you know he completely disarms you from that let's say you have a meeting with him to talk about the score of a movie and there's a there's a sense of formality that you know you have your director in the studio let's say five minutes later that formality is out of the window because he's so funny he's so easy to work with the stories he has the script that he talks how he analyzes it what those you know, sub, the subtext that, that he brings out, you know, and you get this full picture, you get inspired. And then it's a yeah. full on conversation about, about things. And, and he said to me from the beginning, you're going to get your orchestra because I told him that, look, I think we need an orchestra for this one and we should keep it fully full on orchestra, depending on uh, what we write. That's a language for the score of the film and the score of the film in the film. I said, that's a different story, but the, the continuity has to be, uh, guaranteed here and we have to have an orchestra that does the whole thing he's like you're gonna get the orchestra we had no idea if we had a budget if we didn't have a budget it's like you're gonna get the orchestra we need the orchestra i'm i'm in let's go for it i'm like let's go for it so yeah so talk to me about that process how did what were those first conversations like and how did you arrive at that place where it's like okay we're gonna do an orchestra we're gonna have character themes and how did you navigate because I know you really kind of touched upon so many different genres of of kind of classic Hollywood ta you know, music, and and you you're talking about it's a movie within a movie. It's about making a movie. So how did you navigate all that, and what was the role of the score in this film? Yeah. Uh, so about the movie, quickly, it's a producer that decides to shoot a movie so that he can kill the the lead actor to collect the insurance money. Yes. To be rich, because the, the the crappy movies that he's been making making. Has, has put him in trouble with the gangsters that had lent, lent him money to shoot those movies. Right, right. So that's now you have Robert De Niro as the producer and, and uh, Morgan Freeman as the gangster and Tommy Lee Jones as the actor that uh, everybody's trying to kill and he doesn't want to die, you know? Yeah, and, he just never goes to plan. Exactly. And at the end, they make such a good movie that they want, they win the Oscar, you know? So it's <laughs> just such, a, such an out there like story. Uh, the way I approached it is we dissected the story into three three parts one is the movie the story of this producer that is going through through a tough time dealing with uh, with the gangsters he has to give money he doesn't have and how do we approach this and obviously it had to be thematic and uh, and uh, i want it to be dark though because um it's a dark story it's someone plotting to kill someone i mean yeah you know? it's a serious uh yeah even though it's a comedy you're dealing with some dark yeah it's a kind of a dark uh, dark theme yeah. However, I did say to George, that, look, uh, he's a dreamer. This guy's a dreamer. I mean, he doesn't want to give up. I, 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 I have to acknowledge that. You know, <laughs> so I see that as a guy that doesn't want to give up. You know, it, it yeah. reminded me of my father. You know, during communism, he went through hell and he still kept going for some reason. And uh, of course, the, the compare my father never plotted to kill anybody or anything like that but <laughs> that you know of we I, don't know no, i'm just kidding we don't know yeah yeah you're right but i wanted to start uh, dark and then as the movie progresses i want it um, to become uh, more more happy and more uh, we accomplish things and, and that sense of accomplishment and and, and friendship because three improbable guys characters the producer the mobster and the actors they become friends at the end uh, yeah, for the Western, I didn't want to go um, the spaghetti Western style because um, I don't know. I just felt that it's it's kind of done. It's kind of, not that it's done because also the orchestral stuff is done. But 
I just didn't, it didn't feel right. So I wanted yeah. to, to, I wanted to pay homage more to the, to the real golden age of the film scoring, which was the Steiner years and the Tiomkin years and, the, you know, the Bernstein. Those frontier Americana kind of, yeah. Exactly, exactly. <clears throat> so that's where we went and George was full on. He's like, keep going. Uh, there is one theme though that uh, I really wanted to, to, to have my own sensitivities as a European kind of composer. And it's, that's the Tommy Lee Jones theme when he talks about the, the, the improbable uh, love story that he had with his black lady that he never materialized it because it was impossible for a star to, to marry a black woman in mm -hmm. those years. <clears throat> and about regrets and about these kind of things and I said to George I, I want to write a romantic uh, like a, a real romantic sting section kind of a cue there and he's like knock yourself out <laughs> go for it <laughs> and uh, yeah it's so nice because it completely gave me that freedom so it's super thematic so uh, De Niro is a producer uh, the character's name is Max Barber he has this theme it's a bassoon based theme. Uh, uh, the technique is the light motif, the way that kind of Wagner kind of used the light motif that would, would drag the whole storytelling through music by that light motif. Is there, there's a theme, but it's still moving and shifting and going and at times a bit atonal, but then as soon as it becomes atonal, then you go back to it because it didn't want to go too far off <laughs> the, right. the, what's on screen. And yeah, and then you have the Western, which is more of the, the let's say, the, the Americana kind of style. And then there is a bit of this um, unfulfilled love story, which is actually, for me, that's that's the heart of the movie, actually. Yeah. So it's, talk, uh, it, you're juggling so many different pieces here. Was it uh, difficult to find the, but I want to talk about the comedic aspect of the film. You know, it, I feel like the two hard things, uh, you know, to, to really make well is like, I think horror and comedy. You could, it can be really... You know, it can be bad horror, bad comedy, but to make it really good, you really have to. It's all about timing and and where. Yeah. So, so for the music, how did you navigate the comedic aspect of the film? Did you just stay away from that? Did you want to comment on it? Or you just like, okay, the performers can handle that part, and I'm going to comment on these more of the character stuff. Or, so what was your approach in that sense? Yeah, my approach was actually uh, the second part of your uh, description here. I wanted to stay out of it. I didn't want to okay. make it. A House. I didn't want to do any, uh, he's saying something super funny. I don't want to highlight it. I just want to keep going with the, with that theme that I've established for him and let the, the audience, they get it. It's, I mean, the audience is very smart. Yeah. You know, at times, you have to respect the intelligence of your audience, I think. Of course. And I just wanted to comment overall, like old school writing. You just have the music there, the, the part of the storytelling, but not necessarily you know highlighting everything every joke he makes and, and so on obviously when he's doing something that we had to really highlight it we went for it right there's a moment there's a moment for example when he's trying to cut uh, a piece of wood so that the actor when he steps on it he falls into a you know into a to his death actually yeah. that i we had to make this one like the biggest dark walls ever you know <laughs> because, so it's so grotesque the whole thing uh, uh, so the humor for me was go as big as you can you know and yeah. that's going to be very funny because you have this western with a guy on a horse and everybody's trying to kill him and then you have this music that goes on like like you have like 500 you know horsemen running you know to conquer a, a ca like a huge castle or something like you know it's very <laughs> it's big and you notice it and you say what the, what is going on here you know it's just a guy on a horse what's going on you know so but that was the idea to go grotesque and to write it as a very serious film be that the real film or the making of the film and actually there is also a third part in this whole thing it's also the bad movies that the producer makes right with, the, with, uh, with the gangster for that one we went uh, 70s funk like <laughs> Full on funk, and uh, we had a blast. Uh, we had this amazing orchestra, Nashville, and uh, this band. We had a blast. So yeah, you recorded. You record in Europe. You record in LA and Nashville. You had the other, I mean, around 100 musicians, right, that worked on the score. Yeah. Yes, we had the orchestra in Berlin. Uh, it was recorded and mixed in Berlin. I decided to also mix at the same place where I recorded. Oh wow! Uh, the choir was done in Macedonia. 
uh, the soloists were done in, in LA, acoustic guitar, harmonica, a bit of fiddle, uh, and the and the, the band, the, the funk band was done in Nashville. Wow, so how did you keep all that organized in your head? You know, I feel like it's like, uh, did you have like a spreadsheet where you're like, you know, you're developing, or this is like, how did you map out the score? I mean, how did, especially recording it, I feel like you're getting piece by piece and you just have a wait. Did I make sure I get that? It's almost like a shot list. I would think you know, I, I'm not a musician, so I come from it from like a filmmaking perspective. So I'm curious how you keep it organized in your head. Yeah, you it would have been impossible. It would have been impossible if you don't get the right people to to part of the team, for example. Uh, let's say for the, the the biggest piece for this whole puzzle was uh, was the orchestra mm -hmm. and the mix and the mixing because. I could have gone anywhere in Europe. Let's say you go, you 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 know, you give them the budget and you tell them I need this, I need that, whatever. But it's a question of also sound. I wanted a specific sound. It's it's a score that has heavy uh, brass use, and um, I wanted a specific sound for it. Uh, you know, LA would have been perfect. London would have been perfect, but budget didn't allow. And sure. then I had then I had Tom Roosevelt, my engineer, that came to LA and said to me, "Look, if you come to Berlin." We'll take care of you and we'll, we'll give you anything you want. You don't have to worry. We're just going to go for the result. And that was one of the best decisions I've ever made for this score because the things that these people did in, in Berlin, I mean, it was not, okay, we have a four-hour session. It's five minutes later, we're done. No, it, it was never a question of, okay, let's get this done, get paid and leave. It was, right. it was really, really, everybody was invested in, in making it sound as good as it could, as we could have it, and then, and then some more during the mixing stage. As we were mixing, they kept changing the the cuts in LA, uh, the, the the edit, and we had to go back and redo a few things here and there. And there was never a complaint about you know oh this all that. I mean, an amazing experience all around. And Tom, then he mixed it, and it was it's it's it sounds great. It sounds great to me. Yeah. So, so the the, fi the the final. I mean, the whole the whole score is fantastic. And I'm curious, uh, do you have a favorite scene or a favorite moment or maybe favorite character that you really love to score? Was there something that sticks out to you? Do you look back at like, oh, that's really creatively rewarding for me? <laughs> I and mean, there was so different. I mean, Max Barber's theme, uh, the theme that develops, uh, De Niro, basically. De Niro's character is, has this bassoon, has some, the leitmotiv concept. And it, I don't know, at times may sound a bit like Stravinsky, maybe the, the use of the bassoon, I guess, because we always have these sensitivities, what sound sonorities sure. we like, yeah. the orchestration and so on. And then you have Tom Lee Jones, this uh, John Wayne kind of a, you know, character on a horse, but then he has that moment where he talks about this unfulfilled love story with this, uh, you know, uh, African-American actor that never, that he regrets for the rest of his life. And that's a moment that I actually I said, you know what, this is going to be for me. I want to hit this. I want to really, it's strictly a string section piece. And uh, it comes into the film a couple of times. And uh, yeah, three times, I think, just, just to have it there. I think that's my favorite um, that's my favorite moment, actually, to tell the truth. And and yeah. there is also the the, the so-called overture that is for the end credits. Uh, oh yeah, that's like that's where you get to show oh, kind of here's your presentation of everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it has it has a bit of a theme uh, some somewhere in there, but it was written um, it was written like literally like an overture. Okay, here's a little piece that kind of you know this is the movie basically. Yeah. So. Um, so. Uh, if that was if that was the most rewarding part, I'm curious what's the most challenging part. Was there a scene or a character that was like, I don't know how am I going to do this without messing up all the other parts, or did you maybe take a couple tries to get to it? Is there a part that really kind of challenged you as a composer? Yeah, the uh, yes, the uh, the challenging actually theme was the Max Barber one, the producer, oh, okay. uh, the Nero's theme. That I kept writing, kept writing, kept going back to it, and I didn't want to get stuck stuck on it. Uh, so I said to George, you know what, I'm not there yet I, i'm not feeling it yet 100 percent. i'm there 95 percent. but let me keep writing the rest and it will come eventually and and actually just just eventually it was just written somehow so uh, <laughs> there's a couple of moments there's a couple of moments when when he's really when he's in the act of let's say um turning on the gas stove so that it could explode and kill the actor in the in the meantime or when he's trying to 
poke the horse so the horse can throw the actor down and so the actor dies and so on. Where I really want for a string section, super staccato, completely atonal, very Bartokish kind of a thing. And George is like, yeah, go for it. It sounds great. It's, yeah, it's like it fits somehow with this insanity, you know. So it's it's a it's a dream come true to 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 be part of a project like this because you you get to write stuff that you don't get to write very often. Um, Absolutely, and I'm so happy that you finally get it because I know this movie had a long journey to coming to the screen. It got hit with the pandemic and pushed and moved around, and and I think finally we're doing a proper release coming soon, right? It's going to be back in theaters and. I well, I'm not sure. I, yeah, they're talking about now. Finally, the movie will come out. The soundtrack is coming out. Yeah, August the soundtrack 19. is coming out. And the movie, I think, is slated for September somewhere. Uh, yeah, I think they're still they... figuring out the dates. I'm not sure if it's finalized, yeah. but I, I, it's exciting that it's finally. I think you know you get to. Fine. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> it's been released uh, like in different countries in the world, except uh, I think U.S., North America, or something like that. So right. uh, I can't wait for the theater because it's a different. Uh, I saw I saw a screening. It's a different experience to see them in a theater with people, because they kind of respond to to moments when you when you're like, okay, are they going to laugh now? Are they going to get it? And of course they're going to get it. Of course they're going to laugh, and you're going to laugh even harder because they're laughing, and it's just such a good experience. And it's a feel good movie at the end of the day, you know. Yeah. And it's it's making fun of our our own industry, and it's you know it's making fun of the whole process of making movies and how these people would do anything to make a movie you could you could say oh that's bad but i also see it as you know they're they're dreamers they're you know i see that little side of the dreaming part being a dreamer you know yeah it's it's so, a love it's a love letter as well as a little jab as well yeah exactly exactly <laughs> so but it's a good um, it's a good laugh it's a feel good film every everybody did everything they could to to everything they had into the movie and it does show it does show i mean you know george has been on this uh, he george for, here's a little story about this this film george has seen the original film the comeback trail the original one i don't know in 1970 something at a museum in new york and since then he had been looking to find the script and the owner of the the the, wow. the ip and then three, four years ago, he's at a dinner, and next to him is uh, is uh, Joy, one of the producer, also uh, producers, also the wife of the original writer, Harry. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's just so you know. And Joy tells him, uh, "My husband was used to be a director, and oh, he did this movie." And Joy's like, "Oh my goodness, I've been looking for the person that owns the rights to the." I want to do it, and that's how. And then they did a reading with De Niro, and I mean, De Niro said, I, "I'm doing it. I'm, I love this." And yeah, I know. That's how... De, De Niro and George go back. I mean, he wrote Midnight Run. You know, yes, exactly. Classics so, and Bad Boys. I mean, George has been in the industry forever, so yeah, of course. But uh, everybody kind of liked the project and wanted to do it, and and there is something to be said about that. It, it was not done out of necessity or out of other goals or let's say financial goals or, or i don't know what you know it was done because everybody wanted to do it so yeah everyone wants to make the best movie they can and have fun doing it exactly and it shows i think it shows um it shows it, it shows, shows on the screen it shows in your music um so i mean congratulations on, on what an amazing accomplishment with you, you you know with your friend george and the whole cast and the crew and yeah. um so uh, before we uh, wrap things up though i'm curious uh do you have anything coming up next that you can talk about uh, what are we what can look forward to in the future i know maybe you can't speak on everything but <laughs> is there anything you can share uh, after that one actually we did another one with george um it was called vanquish yes uh so uh so the, the story continues with george yeah. um after yeah so we're talking about a new film that george has in the making um he's been signed to write a movie about gangsters and um, so i think we're gonna have fun with that one too so oh, nice and um, but that's a real drama it's not a black yeah. comedy so <laughs> right I'm so you get it yeah. get to flex your serious chops a little bit <laughs> just a bit just yeah yeah, <laughs> well, yeah aldo, but, uh, well aldo thank you so much for your time this evening it's so great to to, to, to meet you this is the first time i've got to talk to you so so thank you for enlightening and, and sharing and all your you know everything about your process so it was, it was a lot of fun thank you so much thank you so much thank you for the time thank you